miss you. Indeed, we miss you being in New Orleans. We also miss doing what New Orleanians so often do best, welcoming you to our city, telling you about our favorite places, and watching you truly experience the absolute beauty and indescribable magic of this incredibly special place. Everything that you know and love about New Orleans is not only here waiting for you, but it's better than ever. We have been busy getting ready for your arrival and have considered every detail of your visit with world-class dining, a brand new airport, new museums and attractions, and hotels to fit your every need and desire. Our world-class convention center is completing a beautiful new pedestrian park and is beginning renovations to other facilities. We'll even have gumbo on the stove and our musicians are tuning their instruments. So when it comes time for you to return, we'll welcome you back to our table and celebrate with you our 300-year-old traditions. And we know that you will create new ones along the way. Good morning, New Orleans. We love you, New Orleans. Just know that we're thinking of you here in the Crescent City. And we can't wait to see you soon. Love New Orleans. When people come, they never leave. Because we're swinging that way. The sun shines so, so bright. The breeze is so, so nice. Data stakeholders are rarely the data experts. Making tools for them means considering how they communicate about data. Rules are a convenient way for humans to express patterns in data, like we need high variable X and low variable Y. In our human in the loop approach, the user selects points of interest and can immediately see rules that differentiate those data from the rest. Lots more detail in the paper, even though it's short. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. I'm Heike Park from Georgia Tech. I'm very excited to present Bluff, a visualization tool to interactively decipher adversary attacks on deep neural networks. Deep learning is now commonly used in many domains. For example, in the medical field, deep learning models can estimate the treatment effects on patients. On the road, we can see self-driving cars using computer vision technologies. However, deep learning models are vulnerable to adversary attacks. An adversary attack applies carefully crafted perturbations on data inputs and fools a model into making incorrect predictions. Adversary attacks jeopardize many deep learning based technologies, especially in security and safety critical applications, such as data driven healthcare and self driving cars. Due to the threats of the adversary attacks, people cannot confidently use deep learning models. To overcome the vulnerability of deep learning models, we need to understand how the adversary attacks permeate the model's internals. Also, for a better understanding about adversary attacks, it would be worthwhile to examine if and how an attack's strength changes how the model produces incorrect predictions. For example, it would be useful to know if a stronger attack exploits the same neurons as a weaker attack does, or if those sets are completely different. We present Bluff, an interactive visualization tool for discovering and interpreting how adversary attacks mislead DNN into making incorrect predictions. Our main idea is to visualize activation pathways within a DNN traversed by the signals of input data. For given input data, an activation pathways consists of neurons that are highly activated and the most influential paths. Activation pathways represent what features are detected and how those features are related to contribute to the final prediction. To understand how the attacks manipulate the neurons and the paths inside the models, Love visualizes the activation pathways of both benign inputs and attacked inputs. That is, Bluff finds and visualizes the most activated pathways given benign and attacked input data. 
Love also visualizes the most inhibited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack is blocking the signals to the benign path. Also, Bluff visualizes the most excited paths by the attack to uncover where the attack stimulate to induce the activation pathways going towards wrong directions. The Bluff interface tightly integrates three coordinate views. It consists of control sidebar, graph summary view, and detail view. Here, a user inspects why a deep learning model must classify adversarial giant beta images crafted by the projected gradient descent attack as armadillo. In the main graph summary view, we visualize the activation pathways of benign and attacked input data. Here, each vertex represents a neuron. When hovering over a neuron, Bluff shows the detailed information of the neuron. The detailed view for a neuron shows a feature visualization and example data that visualize what feature the neuron is detecting. For example, for giant panda images, this neuron looks for face of animals that have white furs and dark eyes. Feature visualization is a synthesized image that maximizes the corresponding neuron's activation. Dataset examples are patches of images from the training data that highly activate the corresponding neurons. We also show how the neurons median activation will change according to different attack strengths. Here in the graph summary view, the neurons are represented with different colors based on their roles. The green nodes are the most important neurons only for the original class giant panda, which means they are highly activated by benign giant panda images. The blue nodes are important neurons only for the target class armadillo. The orange nodes are the most important neurons for both original and target classes giant panda and armadillo. The red nodes are the neurons that are highly activated by only successfully attacked images. These neurons are exploited by the attack to induce the incorrect prediction. By exploring the activation pathways, PGD successfully perturbed pixels to induce the brown bird features, an appearance more likely shared by an armadillo than a panna. Both armadillo and brown birds have small, roundish, and brown bodies. The brown bird neuron that- Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, spotlight on the role of visualization in industrial production. Uh, this is a spotlight uh, featured with Petra Gospodnetic uh, by myself and here at Schoenemann from Leipzig University. Um, first, I want to elaborate a bit on why do we think the spotlight is actually needed. Um, there are so many attempts to create a stronger connection between research and the industry and the VIS community. Uh, for example, we have industrial keynotes by now at VIS 2020. We have the VIS and practice workshop this year, but already since, uh, let's say, four or five years. Um, we also had a VisGap workshop last year at Eurovis, which we're going to repeat next year again. And this really, is, and there is so much more effort on bringing industry into our community, or at least putting something like a, like a bridge between those two worlds. And uh, I actually tried to visualize this uh, intersection between those two worlds. So there's on the one side, what we are doing is we're doing uh, visualization research, and then there's the industry. And actually you would imagine that there should be an intersection somehow. But in reality, this intersection is actually really, really small. So the problems are like everyone works actually for industry. Like if we don't have a problem or something stated to us, there's actually nothing we can really work on because like, you know, we need problems. Uh, everyone talks about the industry. Like I, heard, I hear so many talks and, and topics that are like, we really, we want to mingle with the industry. We need that. Um, and everyone actually really tries to engage with the industry, but there is somehow this gap between industry and visualization research. And we would really like to know where this comes from and how we can do something against that. So. Our first thoughts on why is it so hard to mingle with the industry were like, if we look on what are the goals of industry and what are the goals of visualization researchers, if you look into industry, they're usually closed. And I don't think I, they don't do that intentionally, but 
like they try to make money and they try to bring up a new product and they need to be the first bringing up the product in order to make money. So this results in a completely profit oriented way of thinking, a completely profit oriented way of doing things and, and actually do, even if they do research, this research is going to be profit oriented and problems that they have are not stated clearly to the rest of the world like they know their problems but they're not really willing to share their problems because to make people feel like you're doing something cool and you want to buy things from from you it doesn't really help if you say like we, we have problems on the other hand visualization research is open or at, la at least we try to be open. I mean, we all know those problems on publishing and things, but in general, we try to be open. Um, we try to be free for all because that's actually something that we try to do for society. And um, we try to find problems in all different kinds of areas and solve them and help someone soci uh, somehow society to become better. So how can we help visualiz uh, can visualization research help in solving problems of industry? And how can we connect those two worlds, industry and visualization research to really create this intersection that I've been talking about? Um, our first attempt that we have here, our first idea that we have here, we uh, got a special issue in computer graphics and applications which is on the role of visualization in the, factory, in the manufacturing industry. And the idea is here to generate a picture of the current state of visualization that is out in manufacturing industry. Because it's really actually really, really hard to create this picture and to understand what is actually there and what are the open problems. Um, the, this call just got online some days ago. The submission date is going to be September 2nd in 2021. So there's plenty of time. You can uh, prepare your manuscript and show us your exciting work that you're doing in collaboration with manufacturing industry. And we are really, really interested in seeing what you are working on with the industry. So again, the spotlight and the special issue. What are the goals for today? What are the goals for the next one and a half hours? Um, we actually try to understand or define standards that are out there that the industry gives us and say like, this is actually what we need from you. Um, we try to understand what is our role in manufacturing industry. Uh, we want to highlight hot topics and research directions. As I said before, it's uh, industry doesn't really talk about their problems, but we really try to understand them. And if we can do that, we can probably help them. And we try to find key points that define the industry visualization field. So to achieve all those goals, or at least let's say try to start achieving those goals, um, we want to have some reviewing of experts, and those experts are going to speak in a second, uh, from this research and from the industry. And we want to also highlight the opinions from the this community. And this is where I, where I ask you as the audience, uh, to put some questions and think about what I talked before and what uh, the speaker is going to talk about in a second and see if we can discuss all of those points and figure out some starting points on where we need to go in the visualization research direction and industry. So what are we going to do now? We're having three awesome talks. Uh, the first one's given by Sebastian Clotty from Pravo and his uh, talk's going to, uh, his name is Make It Beautiful. Uh, second, there will be Vanessa Kretschmer. She's with Leipzig University and she's going to talk about tender driven visualization. And the last one is Johanna Schmidt from BRVIS, and uh, she's going to talk about emphasizing the importance of visual analytics in industry. And after that, as I told you before, we're going to have a big open discussion where you can feel free to ask either us as the organizers or what I prefer that you ask one of our invited speakers about their talks and about their opinions in visualization research and industry. So with that being said, I would uh, give the word to our first speaker, Sebastian, and uh, let's start. Stage is yours. Perfect, thank you for the introduction. So I will share my screen. So I can hope uh, I hope you can share uh, can see my screen. Thanks for the opportunity to let me speak in this application spotlight. 
Um, I really like the topic. I really like bridging the gap between visualization research and visualization using industry um, because I come from both. So let me talk uh, first introduce myself. Wait a second. Uh, why does this not work? Let me first talk about myself. Who, who is this guy now talking to you? So I'm now the manager of 3D engineering. That's my official title, although it's a bit strange at the Ferro Europe GmbH. Um, that company is part of the Ferro Technology Incorporated. And we are producing measuring devices, for example, the restaurant laser scanners to cap capture reality, to reconstruct a virtual representative of, for example, a factory building or something like that. I will go show you some examples later. And the idea is we're doing that to help our customers for planning, for documentation, for whatsoever. So it's really getting the um, reality into a digital form, analysis, uh, run some analysis there, derive data, and then make some decision. Uh, at the moment, I'm so I'm a manager of a small development team of 16 developers divided in three scrum teams for two products. So typical industry chaos. And I have to sort of make sense out of that. I started off as a team lead for the visualization graphics uh, group within this re uh, development group. So you see there, I'm sort of right at this conference. And originally I started out as a normal developer. And before joining Faro, before joining the industry, I was actually in this research community here. So I was working as a postdoctoral researcher at the TU Dresden. And before that, I made my PhD in Tom Apple School at the University of Stuttgart and primarily worked on large particle data sets and the interactive visualizations. So real-time visualizations on those data sets. Now that is my past and what is my present? What is the current kind of data I'm looking at uh, when I work? Um, most of the data originates from 3D laser scanners like our flagship device here, the Faro Focus laser scanner, which basically records distances, including color photos to make a complete image of the real world. And just to give you a glimpse of the size of what we're talking here, one scan here at full resolution would add up to roughly 700 million data points, one scan. And if we are measuring a, a small project, we're easily talking about tens of scans. A usual project even uh, easily goes to multiple hundreds of scans. So data is big enough. We have a lot of uh, um, different information on the data points like the distance, the laser luminance, the color recorded, stuff like that. So it is interesting data and we have a lot of that and that makes sense from a hardware point of view. Now the software of course is needed to make sense out of the data and we have a, a desktop product, Ferrocene, which is developed in my group where we make sense out of the data, where we process the row scans, where we uh, give the users abilities to clean up the data, to combine multiple scans into larger projects um, with optimized data structures, of course, to be able to visually inspect the results and to do the measurements. Because in the end, yes, these point clouds are great and cool and everything, but that's not what our users need. That's not what our users want. Our users need to derive information. They need to know, does this new machine fit into the factory building? Something like that. So um, this is only an immediate, uh, intermediate step. All of our work at our company are for the intermediate steps. So an important part, of course, is the visualization here. We're recording the data, it's 3D spatial data, and we need to understand what, what we have. So the visualization aspect is important. But the interesting thing is that what exactly, what kind of visualization is important for our users? And I want to give you a couple of examples. So first of all, you, you might know the visualization is, um, or we do visualization for different purposes. And one of the purpose is for understanding the data, what we have, and supporting us in manually editing the data as we go along. And so that's the first use case. If I want to edit, if I want to inspect, if I want to understand the data I'm having, I need the visualization which supports me on that. And for example, here, uh, I got a couple of examples for false color visualization. Here, for example, what we see color coded is the distance from the scanner within this um, snapshot of 
uh, a small factory building. And yes, that's the rainbow color map. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So the, the rainbow color map, of course, is infamous because uh, of the of the um, of all the problems with perception and, and distances and everything. Yes, it doesn't matter at all. All I need you to understand here, all I want to see here is, is an area red or blue? I don't care if it's a slight greenish blue cyan type color, never will be. If I spot a point and say, oh, that is blue, why is that blue? I will always go in with my mouse, with my data picker and look at the data. I'm only interested in spotting places. I will never be interested in spotting numbers because numbers are numbers, not colors. Another example going in a similar color is, for example, by elevation or distances from a planned mesh or anything like that, deviations in the, in, in the uh, general case. And the same thing here. I'm not interested in precise information. I'm just interested in areas. And so, for example, if I see, oh, there is cable here and the cable ends there at the wall, I need this distance. I will not rely on visualization for the distance. I will go in with a measuring tool. So I need to understand where to look at, and then I need another tool to look at the real data behind it. Um, another thing now is if we combine multiple visualizations to help us understand the data, we can use it, for example, to segment the data. Now, this is experimental visualization. It's not part of our products yet. If you want to steal it, please ask me before nicely. So we, what we can do here is we can uh, uh, put in a grid, a visual grid on the data to help supporting the, the, the sense of distance, because this is something which is a little bit different or difficult in visual um, in complete digital visualizations. And we just need a little bit support. We don't need exact perception of millimeter precision, just a grid to say, okay, that's a four meters block, done. And then a little bit more abstract, a very important visualization, what we have here is a color by age. So we have all these markers for different laser scans, which were made over time on this uh, rather small project, and they're colored by age. And that is important because not I'm, I, I don't need to understand, oh, this scan is two weeks old. I just need to know that's old. How old? I will look into the data. So again, the visualization is here to give me hints, and that's the lessons learned. I need a qualitative inspection by the visualization, and I will use my data pickets and my real numbers to understand the details. That is for the visualization purpose of understanding, editing, and inspection. And honestly, that is not the core reason why we do visualization in our industry. The core reason is for communication. The core reason is I want to convince someone about a, some aspect about, uh, about the reality, which can be seen in my visualization. So that is for me the visualization research uh, reason for communication. For example, inspection for buildings for, to be refitted. And here we have an example which even supports virtual reality. I can go into a factory which exists and look at, can I add the plumbing? Can I add the air vents where they have to be? Does everything fit? And this is something, yes, I can plan all that stuff, and then I can put my board member into a VR headset and say, have a look at that. They will be thrilled. They will be happy. And they will say, yes, go ahead, spend all our money on that. Perfect. That's the reason for visualization. If we're talking about communication, another important aspect here is the documentation then. If we have something and we say we need to preserve it, we may need to make sure that it works out, this is not a very good example. So in the direction of cultural heritage. And here, I don't even care for color maps anymore. What I need to have is a real capture of reality, a best in class capture of the color and best in class representation of the data I have. And documentation is not always as nice as here showing amazing churches. Sometimes ah, it's a little bit a more realistic scenario, for example, crime cases. This is really one of our major markets. So I want to show it here. Don't worry, the girl is alive. At least she was when this was recorded. At least that's one uh, what the original author of the data told me, that he didn't want to kill the girlfriend of his son. 
Um, nevertheless, what you see here is it works out. Think of that as a 3D photograph and think of that. You have a crime scene like that or an arson scene or whatever, and you need to go to court uh, with, uh, as an evidence. It needs to look convincing. It must not look like your CG Hollywood movie. It must not look like a computer generated graphics. It must look convincing, realistic. So in that, let me summarize. What is important, really, really, really important for at least my type of industry is using, visual, is using visualization for communication, for storytelling, for convincing people. But extended storytelling tools are not needed. The storytelling will be done by experts. The data needs to speak for itself, need to be convincing by itself for the audience. From the, the all inspection part, the visualization will never replace numeric inspection with data pickers and such. So the false color visualization is important and is helpful, but only for a couple of experts, not for the broad audience. So to support the trust in the data, we need a visualization for the broad audience and the broad audience are amateurs and, and managers. So basically the people who give us the money to spend on research again. So, um, that's why I want to say, please make it beautiful, make it convincing for the broad audience. With that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you. And I hope for a lively discussion. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for that really nice talk. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Vanessa Kretschmer. So the stage is yours, Vanessa. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen. And also, thanks for the opportunity to share my views and experiences on tensor-driven visualization in the recent years. Uh, first, uh, to introduce myself even further, I hold a master's degree on applied computer science. So my background is from computer science. And during my study, I quickly developed an interest for computer graphics and visualization. Currently, I'm a PhD student at the Leipzig University. And over the course of the, my PhD study, I specialized myself and focus on tensor visualization problems with a close connection to the structure mechanic domain. The interest in structure mechanics problems arise naturally since I was part of a major joint research priority program funded by the German Research Foundation. Uh, it was about the design and characterization of metal carbon fiber reinforced polymer joints. The reason for this funding was to develop an alternative to classical interlocking methods like bolts, screws, and rivets, marked by the red circle here, and was aimed for mass production in lightweight construction like car and airplane manufacturing. So therefore, the vast majority of my colleagues and partners were mechanical engineers. And over the course of the project, I was able to gain insights into the domain, uh, their terminology, their common problems, their workflow, and also their mindset. And based on these experiences, I want to share these insights, highlight challenges, and also tell you some wishes for our community in terms of tensor related visualizations. To start, it is important to differentiate between the different areas of mechanics. Not only there are quite some differences between structural mechanics, geomechanics and biomechanics, for example, but even inside a single domain, say structural mechanics, their problems differ a lot uh, related to the differences they hold and use different quantities when dealing with their problems. This also extends to tensors as well, as they are a common quantity used for simulation and evaluation. But of course, there are also a lot of similarities. Uh, for example, the stress tensor is present in structure mechanics and biomechanics and in geomechanics. So in all three mentioned mechanic domains. And therefore, and to understand the domain we are working with, it is important to start by gaining knowledge. This includes uh, basic terminology, as this will prevent misleading information and false communication. Uh, to give some examples, they are using words as synonyms like principal stresses is used for eigenvalues of a stress tensor, or more critically, they are using the same words as we do, but holding a slightly different meaning. A great example is isotropy, uh, which refers to material properties, but for our domain, it's often specified for tensors. Uh, topology is another great example, as engineers can mean the geometric structure of a component, 
where we use it for the structure of tensor field representing areas of different behavior. Well, next, it's quite important to observe their workflow as well. And this ranges from daily tasks to the software they are using. And this helps to identify occurring repetitive challenges, as well as offers the information where and how visualization can fit their workflow. But nevertheless, it's also important to focus on non-repetitive specific problems, which is often the reason why a collaboration emerges in the first place. Regarding their tools, my experience overlie the reports found in recent literature. To sum this up, they are often used standard software like Excel and PowerPoint, which helps them to build basic graphs and diagrams. But as you guessed, more elaborated techniques like parallel coordinates or Senke diagrams, for example, are rarely used or even known. This continues for their simulation software, which often includes simple spatial visualization approaches like ISO surfaces or colored surface display. Uh, and it's often used for derived values like the Formesis Yield criterion instead of like showing the whole tensor. For the analyze of directions of the tensor, they can also use a hedgehog visualization plotting simple arrows, but a lot of them. And this would quickly lead to clutter and occlusion. And they also have, the, uh, of course, the possibility to select points or cells and observe tensor components. But I think you would all agree that this is not really efficient. And yes, the default coloring method is always the beloved rainbow color map. And it's not so that they wouldn't have the option to change that as I displayed here by the screenshot, but I rarely didn't saw them doing this. So now that we know how limited their tools are, the question of what is missing arises. Well, one answer would be everything published by our domain. This includes, for example, line and texture-based methods. And they really want these methods, as shown by the work of Moldenhauer two years ago, who exploited the thermal conductivity analysis by setting the specific heat transfer directions to the eigenvectors of the stress tensor field. He showed that with this off-label use, it is possible to, to generate stress tensor lines for a given surface. And I think this example shows perfectly that there is a need for specific techniques in their area. And also besides line and texture-based techniques for our communities offer way more like cliffs, which I will cover in the next slide, as well as methods of geometrical, topological, multivariate or feature-based nature. But sure, that would be quite some effort for commercial providers to include everything. So now talking about cliffs, they are a powerful method to visually display a whole tensor, like the recent we visited superquartic cliffs by Patel and Laidlaw. And although they are covered quite extensive by our domain, you rarely see such cliffs inside a mechanical domain, with maybe one exception being the so-called beach ball cliff used for moment tensor in the geological domain. But for the mechanical domain, the known cliff I was able to find was the Moore cycle displayed here. And I also talked to some engineers and they really agree on that. And therefore I see a gap between cliffs known by the domain experts and cliffs published in our domain. But why? The reason is simply that they are rarely talked in during their academic studies of mechanical engineering, for example. I assume this has to do with being at one hand, a local visualization method, uh, not itself showing continuity for a given field, and even more that taking a stress tensor as an example, you still need the material specific information about which tensors are leading to a damage or failure. And even though they are great for exploring tensor fields and really deserve more visibility outside our domain. So now for people unfamiliar with tensor visualization methods, I now want to provide a quick example on how visualization can exactly help engineers here again at an example for structural mechanics. In 2014, Kratz et al. presented a paper with the title Tensor Visualization Driven Mechanical Component Design. In their paper, they described how tensor visualization guided mechanical engineers to optimize a brake layer uh, black lever, brake lever used for bicycles. 
they first of all offered a brushing and linking framework for stress tensor field exploration, as well as stress tensor line visualization. Uh, stress tensor lines were also represented by a lick like fabric texture visualization, showing the principal stress directions. And based on shown lines, the engineer then designed internal reinforcement structures with three different geometries. The three geometries that they were then tested against the reference model of a break level commonly produced um in the industry and the result showed that lesser stresses are present for all of the three geometries so the new designs were much better and also they used less materials than the reference model and there are even more examples in the literature uh, of our domain with a similar approach like for example, the optimization of bound prosthetics or even other approaches. And keeping that in mind, that tensor visualization can benefit the mechanical domain. It's also so important to talk about gener general requirements and also challenges. And if we stick to the preferences of the engineers, we can increase the acceptance of our tools and reach for use beyond collaborations. This includes the creation of simple visualization like Sebastian Krottel now uh, showed you. Um, but what I mean by that is also uh, offering a method of high usability uh, for an intuitive design, although this term is not well defined until now. And for example, this can be described even further by using known transfer functions, if present, or then slight variations to match the human perception in terms of color. And as I hinted in the beginning, a seamless embedding into their workflow is highly beneficial and wanted as well. In terms of structure mechanics, they are also used to yield and failure criteria. And therefore, it makes sense to consider them as a part of the visualization or as a comparison tool to evaluate the effectiveness of a visualization approach. And further related to this, I often heard the wish for an existing implication of physical relations when possible. This may be a challenge, but increases the acceptance by a lot. And last but not least, there are often cases in which a real-time frame rates of visualization and the interactivity is really important to them. Now, transitioning into the challenges these preferences arise, the first thing comes to mind is about how to simplify complex data. This sure is one of the core problems of our community where no universal solution exists. Uh, and by complex, I mean the tensorial quantities, especially when looking at or even beyond the second order tensor case. Another kind of complex can be found when dealing with huge data sets uh, that rarely can match random access memory or even workstage, uh, workstation hardware storage. And there we have to consider some sort of streaming or parallel computing where we need the knowledge of methods from different domains of computer science. And another major challenge and problem is considered the availability, which can be divided into three cases. The first case may be the operation system a domain expert is using. This challenge increases even further when offering one solution to multiple domain experts working with different operation systems. Here, I agree on recent literature stretching how important a web-based solution can be, while this may create more challenges for itself, of course. Uh, secondly, images, uh, imaging being a domain expert itself. Um, it seems almost impossible to, to know about every visualization uh, approach currently existing in our domain. Sure, state-of-the-art reports help a lot, but even then, it remains unclear how to obtain these tools. This is further the case as not every tool is published in an open source format. And I'm surely not a good example by myself as this needs extra effort where a dedicated software developer uh, is quite useful. And the third case is about the limited availability of real world example data sets where we can test our prototypes and benchmark our solutions. Now, slowly ending my talk, I want to mention my four wishes. Uh, the first one is considered 
the commercial tools. I would like to see a broader implementation of simple but advanced visualization techniques like stress tensor lines calculation. And the second one is for the lecturer inside the mechanical domains or inside the mechanical domains. Um, try to educate and discuss established visualization techniques to raise awareness and to increase the visibility. I would also suggest that we continue to scatter our methods into the domain publications. The third one is for our community itself. Stick to the engineer and their problem, educate them about our insights of our field and tackle previous mentioned challenges. And for my final wish, I want to say, look beyond the borders of the research area, catch new ideas and stay creative. And here are my used references. And for my final remark, I want to thank you all for your attention and I'm looking forward into the discussion. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for this really nice talk. Uh, our final talk will be given by Johanna and Johanna, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. So I will now share the screen. All right. Um, I would like to talk uh, today about uh, how we could emphasize the importance of visual analytics in, in industry. And I would like to, whoops, I would like to start with an introduction. So my name is Johanna Schmidt. I'm currently the head of the research group Visual Analytics at the Via Vis Research Center. The Via Vis Research Center is located in Vienna. We are a, a COMET center, so we are funded uh, by the state and by industry. And we are in the middle between industry and university research. So very, it's a very similar concept uh, like Fraunhofer, for example. We are about 70 people currently. And um, I would also like to take this opportunity to announce that uh, Harald Pieringer, who some of you probably know, um, left the Via Vis because uh, he founded a spin-off with the Software Explorer. And therefore I'm now following him as the head, as the new head of the research group Visual Analytics. And I uh, will continue his research. So we are working on high dimensional and time oriented data, something that you find a lot in industry when you have sensor data and time dependent data. Uh, and Harald for years successfully um, developed a lot of things here and I'm going to continue that now starting with this year. So, um, we as the visual analytics group at the Via Vis, we have several industry um, research partners. Some of them are from the manufacturing industry. Some of them are from the energy industry. We also have one partner from healthcare uh, and one partner from the automotive industry. So we, um, we get input from different uh, directions in industry and all or what is kind of in common for all of them is that they are working with time dependent data. And our aim that we have in our research group is to provide them with solutions so that they can analyze the data that they have. And they are facing several challenges and they're facing several use cases. Some of them are mentioned here. So for example, there's the problem of data screening to uh, find out the, the quality the data has, if there are missing values or outliers. There's the problem of selection and labeling and also a correlation analysis, something that's very important for time dependent data. We are also working with simulation data. So uh, our partners are also interested in sensitivity analysis for different parameters, especially the partners from the energy domain, they are interested in doing monitoring. So if they have um, models for predicting energy consumption, for example, they would like to monitor the performance of the models and compare it over time. 
And something that's also quite common for time dependent data and for time series data is pattern search and pattern comparison. So those are typical use cases we're dealing with. And all of them are, can be very nicely solved with using visual analytics tools. So for example, um, visual analytics is a really great tool for process managers, for example, to get new insights, to learn something about the data that they didn't know before. So for example, to find anomalies in their process or to relate uh, the anomalies to quality measures or other data sets. Here, for example, um, there's one uh, visualization where you can see the number of errors that occurred in some production process and they are uh, sorted by the error category. And this way the process managers could find out um, which are the main errors we, we face in our production. And um, the, these are things that people or that process managers can find out if they have the possibility to look at the data from various different directions. I mean, this is something we know, we are visual, visual, visual analytics researchers, so this is no surprise for us. Um, one great thing we can provide our partners with is a great speed up in their work. So um, they always tell us that whenever they use our visual analytics tools, then the time they have to spend on data analysis is really greatly reduced. So we have this one uh, example where a process manager told us that before that they could just analyze one quarter of the data in one day, and now they can load four years of data and just need five minutes to analyze it. So to uh, also to check the data distribution and to find changes over time, our tools are really greatly appreciated. So um, I now have two errors on that, uh, on that slide. And that's the reason why, uh, the reason for this is the via this is located in between um, university research and industry. And so we are always working in two directions. So we, uh, we, we take research results and try to make them usable for the industry. That's the arrow now in the right direction. So our daily work consists of convincing our industry partner how important visual in analytics is for their daily work and why they should spend more money on research projects. So that's the error in, in here in one direction. And there is this really great work, which was published in 2015, uh, which has the title, Visual Computing is Key Enabling Technology for Industry 4.0 and the Industrial Internet. And it's a very nice article. It, is, it describes the different parts of Industry 4.0. I have to apologize for the bad quality of the image here on the slide, I took it from the paper. Um, basically what you see is our different technical uh, developments in industry 4.0, so like cybersecurity and big data and so on. And there's this one bubble of visual computing and they actually announced that visual computing and visual analytics is a key or are key technologies in industry 4.0. So you cannot do industry 4.0 projects without visual computing. And I would say, wow, I mean, that's great. Um, but something went wrong, obviously, because I'm, I'm sitting here in my office in Vienna. I mean, I like that office, it's totally fine, but why I'm not sitting somewhere in the Caribbean because we were showered with money by our, our industry partners because they simply cannot live without us. So what happened? And um, that's the, the, the problems we face when talking to our industry partners is that the, it's very difficult to communicate the impact of visual analytics because impact for industry partners always means money. And the reason why we cannot communicate the impact properly currently is that it's very hard to transfer 
the results or, and the gain of visual analytics to money and to numbers. There are also other hindering problems, like usually the data is not in a proper state. So in many cases, when we start projects, then we, we start with a requirement analysis and, and try to explain to people what they could do with the data and what they need and how the quality of their data looks like and so on before we can even do visualization. But it's also that um, the, the need for visual analytics is kind of clear for the people working with data, but it's very hard to communicate the impact to other areas in industry because so we or we, we try to find different ways how to uh, communicate this impact and um, one way to do that is to say we could calculate the working time that is that workers have to spend less time on data analysis and that would save money for the industry partners um, the problem here in austria is that maybe that's different in other in other countries, but in, in Austria, there's often the saying that, yeah, but I have to pay the workers anyway. And if they take, if it takes them to analyze the data, if it takes one day to analyze the data or two days, it doesn't really matter. So it's hard to communicate it in that way. And also visual analytics is a software solution and, and costs for software are, are usually calculated to be very low. And another problem we have is that visual analytics is always considered an enabling technology. So we are never at the end of a process. So the, the overall goal of Industry 4.0 is to save money and to make the production more efficient. And we are kind of enabling that, but we are not the ones at the end where you can say, okay, if you use the tool, you will save 1 million uh, euros um, that's that's simply not possible. So, but it's also I don't want to complain too much. I mean that's that's the role we as a, we as a VIVIS have to solve in a way. It's just to show you these are mainly the problems we face in our daily work. So we really would like to emphasize the great research that has been done in our communicate in in our community, and we would like to. Um, to broaden the usage of visual analytics. And that's something we as a VIAVIS and other um, research organizations have to do. It's just to uh, get, give you some insights here. But I mentioned the two errors and there's also an error back because we also would like to provide the research community with new interesting research questions. And I would like to give you an example for that because I was asked a very, very interesting question recently by an industry partner. They told me, um, because we are currently planning a new software project together with them and they plan to integrate our solutions into their software. And usually if, if you have a software, then you have some kind of pricing model. So could be, for example, like you have a basic um, package and then you have like an economy package and then a professional package and then they ask me if we would include visualization here would it be possible to adapt the visualization according to the package so for example you have a scatter plot and how would the scatter plot look like if customers just bought the basic version or how would it look like if they bought the professional version and that kind of relates to the research question, what is the information gain of a visualization? How can I uh, translate the information gain to, to a software package and to money in that case? And I think that's a very interesting research question and is one example on the questions we would like to pass back to the community. And uh, my 12 minutes are over. I hope I could give you an interesting insight. And if you have ideas on the last question that I ask here, here's my email address. I'm happy to hear your ideas. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentations. So, and 
we will now continue with the discussion. So I suggest everyone to turn on their mics and cameras. Welcome. <laughs> well, it seems that we had quite a bit of an interest. Uh, all three presentations were really interesting. And I'm just going to start in reverse. So the last thing that Johanna mentioned, what is the information gain of the visualization? It is something that was somehow within all the three of the presentations partially. And I would like to hear what Sebastian and Vanessa think about that. Okay, so maybe I can go first. So um, what Johanna said is perfectly exactly right. So uh, as an industry, we're producing products and we have licensing and pricing models around those products. And those are in line in the gain the user gets from those products. So in the end, we're not stealing money. We're asking for a compensation similar to the gain the user has from using the product. So if we offer a, a variance of our products, so an entry level product and an expert level product, we have to get, uh, so we have to make some clever decisions here. On the one hand, the entry level product should be limited, obviously, it's the entry level. It should be easy to use, it should be simple to use. On the other hand, the entry level product has to make, create the taste for more. The entry level product has to show the user the capabilities without offering all of them. It has to show the user, this is what you could have for just a little bit more money. So, uh, and obviously that's a bad thing. And yes, we do it all the time. And that's how the world is working. So it's very important to understand how we can create a visualization which works, which gain, uh, which creates a benefit for the user, but which also shows the opportunities beyond that, who brings in the creativity of the, of the research aspect to the end user. And I think that is really, really difficult. And if we can see results in that direction, that's, that's brilliant. Vanessa? Um, well, I think um, Sebastian said like everything regarding to this. Um, I'm not sure how I can contribute to this question specifically. Sorry. <laughs> so I, but I'm wondering kind of, so you said we need to create the taste, but with visualization, you need to communicate the data. So does that mean stripping of a level of communication, intentionally stripping of the level of communication, or what does it mean to creating the taste? Can you give us an example of what creating the taste with visualization looks like? Rainbow color map? Rainbow color map is brilliant. I love the rainbow color map. Um, not necessarily. So we don't need to, to limit the, the, the capabilities of the communication. Um, we, at the entry level product must give the user everything the user needs. Because other than that, the person will not buy the product because it's useless then. So, um, but it can show what can go beyond. So and a typical thing would be something like you create, um, Let's stick to um, let's stick to data analytics, uh, to visual analytics and diagram-like visualizations. You could create and offer diagrams and show yes, this is like this and this is like that, and you can communicate the facts you have in your data. And by the way, you could have here a relationship showing diagram, like for example, um, scatter plots, and just hint at them. This also exists. You could try that in a pro package. So offer what they need and show them what else exists. And I mean, our users are all very intelligent and, and clever people as well. They will see the possibilities and we just need to show them the direction. Johanna, what was, what was the solution to the problem? It's still not solved. So uh, I, I got this, or I was asked the question very recently like um, one month ago and I'm still thinking about it and I'm still doing doing research on that how to how to solve that so I'm 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 actually very happy for any input here if someone has ideas um, because I, I also didn't didn't go beyond the, the the basic ideas like you offer a scatter plot but if you want to draw a regression line then you have to buy the economy pro 
pro product, but I think that's not the solution. So it's, um, it's really to have some quantitative measure, what a visualization could give you would definitely help here. But um, I think it's still still open. So um, I don't have a solution, unfortunately. <laughs> So what we what we heard from the three talks is from Sebastian's side of the more industrial side saying we've got basically what we need and we are now playing with it. And that kind of made me to think, so where do you see the research here? Sebastian? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about your uh, of what you said of, about your statement uh, that we got what we need, and I think yes, that is true. But at the same time, is we got what we need, but we don't know what we need, or we don't even know what we could have. So we have a tool for our solution. But maybe slamming in the screws with a hammer is not the best idea. So I think that's the research. Uh, the research is to go in understanding really the problems and then coming up with better tools. Um, Johanna, you, you, you used the term enabling technology. And I think that is exactly what most of the visualization is. Because if I, if I know a problem, if I understand a problem, I can compute my solution done. If I don't know the problem, I need to look at what we have. And then visualization is, is extremely powerful. And this looking at the data can be super simple by just printing out what we have, which only works for 2D or 3D. Or we need to derive a good representation. And the, the, the tensors Vanessa was talking about is, is a great example. You cannot just draw a tensor like that and everyone will understand it. It's a complicated problem which needs a not that simple solution. And I think to find the best not so simple solution is, is what, what's still unsolved. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. so from Johanna uh, and Vanessa, I would like to hear your comment on that. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Uh, um, it's really hard. I, I also mentioned that you have to uh, learn about their workflow, like their daily task, and um, you you have to to observe uh, domain experts or user, and you have to to check back uh, what what do they really want? Is it just a specific problem they told you, or is it more beyond that? Well, I think most of the time they are not really knowing about what is another problem they are having, they are not seeing it. And therefore it's, it's quite important to follow them around and to, to really get to know how they are working. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So I think uh, one key, um, key enabler would be if we manage to integrate our solutions into the existing workflows because providing providing them with standalone systems again uh, is is not is not the way i think because we are we are somewhere in between if people use visual visualization or visual analytics they actually want to solve another problem so they, the problem is not uh, to look at the data and to make it beautiful, but they want to solve another problem. They want to understand their, their process. They want to understand their manufacturing process. And we are kind of in the middle. And I think we have to more clearly see how people work, how, the, how they, the, the workflows are defined and fit our tools into those workflows. I think that's a very important way to, to go. Uh, so I actually have another question. Uh, this is actually going for Sebastian. So how do you actually judge the value of color scale research? I mean, you've been talking, uh, you seem to be a really big fan of the rainbow color uh, table. And I, I know there are people that would probably pretty much hate you for that statement. So how I do you so. judge the value of color scale research? 
so don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't love uh, the rainbow color map. Um, it's there, um, it's working, um, it has its problems without doubt. Um, but on the other way, I think uh, the, uh, so, and the research on the perception aspects on color are important because um, uh, if we, this is a very important aspect of the communication um, construct or a communication use case for visualizations. We want to understand how our colors will react uh, or will will influence the um, the audience. So it is a very important research on color in general, and then of course in color maps and transfer functions in uh, as, as special cases of that. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to. I don't only want to make fun of things like Color Brewer or uh, reviewers always requesting in my papers to redo all the pictures with a Color Brewer related color map instead of whatever I did before. And it, it, it makes partially sense, but depending on the use case you're working on with the visualization, it doesn't. Sometimes it's just not important. And I think that's one of the things I wanted to uh, I wanted to highlight here with this um, evil speech, that some aspects of the visualization are often just not important at all, and and then in the end, if it's about communication, if it's about make it beautiful, then of course yes, a rainbow color map is very very much not beautiful at all. Uh, and there are better choices here. And the better choices might even be worse than a uh, rainbow color map in, in some perceptual aspects. And you, you should select what you have from what you want to achieve. Uh, so you should select what you want to do, uh, what, what you use by what you want to do, what you want to achieve. And um, yeah, I, I would really, really uh, like it if there would be a different default color map uh, in, in most visualization tools in the industry. Because let's face it, engineers don't have time to do anything. So they especially don't have time to switch to another color map. That's just a waste of time. So they will use the default, whatever the default is. We are having a very lively discussion here and on Discord. So we, Christina and I are doing our best to keep track. So uh, everyone, we are trying to ask all the questions. So we'll see how far we come. So there was a nice question from Wolfgang Eigner. Uh, how can concepts and prototypes from scientific research make their way into products or being uh, being applied without creating a company around it? Uh, well, I would like to start on that. Um, that's quite an interesting topic. Um, there was also a publication to that in the uh, recent literature uh, this year, actually, in August, it was published. And well, I think one way would be to collaborate with the commercial um, distributor, uh, like to have um, a collaboration between uh, scientists and commercial. Um, another way would be to have like a dedicated software developer for academia, which is quite hard because you have to get extra funding and then have to explain why you would need that. So it's really hard, I guess. I would also like to add something here. Hi, Wolfgang. <laughs> That's one thing. The other thing is, um, I think open source is would be an important um, way to go because many, many, especially data analysts are working with Python, are working with R and if they are supplied with solutions that are easy to use that they can quickly just paste into their Python script and then see the result, then I think the, the level to use a visualization in their daily workflow is not too high. So I think that would be an, an important um, contribution for us. So of course, everyone can just join in you don't have to raise the hand. <laughs> um. Okay, wait. The next question there, we had, we had also a little discussion on uh, that there's the problem of if you, if I do a simple visualization, which is 
something that everyone wants to have because simple is easy to understand. I might, I might make the people from the industry happy, but if I try to publish that on this, I might probably not make my reviewers happy and the other way around. If I do something fancy, people from the industry will be like, what should I do with that? And, but maybe I get a paper published on this. So is there, can you imagine any way on how to bring those side, two sides together so that we can publish and make people from industry happy? Maybe, um, so honestly, the, this is just a question from my past. Um, I always tried to do something like that. And I think it really depends on the topic of the, of the research or what you're working at. If it's, a, if it's a foundational research, then well, industry is too, for industry it's too early. And we have in basically all of our communities tracks for application papers. And those are really good examples to bridge in those two aspects to get to take a real problem from the real from industry and um, to create a solution, the best solution possible to show why that is solution is better than the existing solutions. And then it already is a paper. Of course, that might not be um, the best paper award version of a paper but it's a possibility to get, to get both. In the end, I, I fear that industry and research academia have different, um, different aims with what we're doing. And so to bring both together on every paper will, I, I don't think that this will, will be possible, but I think there is an overlap area and that in that overlap, uh, overlap area, you will be able to do that. And, I think application papers are a good point to start. So, Vanessa, you mentioned that you had the main insight before starting. How much did it help you to communicate with the industry experts? And in general, how often do you, all of you, feel that there is a miscommunication between the two? And what are the key points where the miscommunication happens? Well, um... Like regarding the miscommunication, um, it, it started with, with uh, simple things in the beginning. Um, basically, uh, when you talk about uh, durability, the strength or the lifetime of, an, uh, of a component, um, for the engineers, these are completely different quantities than your naive um, impression of it. So therefore, I had a lot of vocabulary to learn in the beginning so that I don't mess around. Another term is, is like load paths. Um, load paths are not really completely defined in the engineering community. And some say, OK, you have to, to calculate energy or to integrate energy to calculate uh, load paths and other People say you have to use like stress and strain tensors or just the stress tensor and create a line on that. Um, this was, was basically my, my first problems regarding to this. And can you repeat the first part of the question again, please? Well, the first part was how did the domain insight help you to, to define so what is important and communicate and to work on the protocols? I think you kind of... Yeah, I, I think that uh, arises naturally. Mm -hmm. So Johanna, uh, Sebastian, so I mean, you are kind of coming from different directions. So Sebastian is coming from industry towards the research. Johanna, you're kind of a mediator between the two. So I mean, you're the researcher, but you have a lot to work with the industry. And so wh where do you feel there is a disparity between? The two? Where, where are the problems? Broad, broad topic, wow. Um, and also like the most thing that really annoys you and bugs you, <laughs> say it. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, it's a very general question. I will, I will try to, yeah, let's, let's put it like that. Um, I, I, kn I know both sides and I like to contribute on both sides. So I, I, like, um, I like the research side and I think 
that the research side needs all freedom to explore new areas and new techniques. I think that's the great part on the research area. And I also like the, the industry part because there you really have people with problems and uh, you need to solve them. And afterwards you really have users using your solutions. And um, that's, that's really nice. And you get feedback like, now I found this new insight because I used your tools and that's, that's really cool. And therefore I like being in the middle. And I think what I would wish for the future of the visualization community, if I can make a wish, would be that um, questions that we bring in from the application side are more regarded in the community, either by uh, new tracks or by new ways how we can publish papers. Because I think that actually the questions we get from the industry are pretty interesting. They're probably not at the edge a research and, and then the new techniques and so on. But just to acknowledge the questions the, research, the, the industry has, I think would be very important. So I think um, the difference where, um, where research and industry are not aligned is on priorities. So um, for, for research, so we, we both face a, an, a problem, a problem we do not have a solution for. Now for research, you create the best solution to the problem, perfectly a new solution, which was not there before. So brilliant research, great. For the industry, you produce a solution in two weeks and a solution in two weeks, which will run on absolutely every PC out there in the world, on every operating system, on every amount of few broken memory chips there are, just has to work. And this difference in priority, I think, is, is where a lot of, let's say, I would call it light frustration comes off, because the industry says, Oh, yes, that's a great solution. And researchers say, I'm not done yet. It's not finished. Don't use it. And Why? It's done. It's good. I can't sell it. And I, I think this is exactly where, where um, both sides maybe should need a, a little bit more patience. And I think that patience comes naturally if we have long-standing relationships, if we have longer partnerships with intern programs, with industry-funded PhDs and stuff like that. I think then we start to understand the priorities of the other sites and uh, connecting institutes like we are, this are a brilliant example for that to support both sides to come together and to understand each other. And I think then everything will smooth out a little bit, only a little bit. It will never go away. I will still want to sell the half-baked solution, but you know. All right. Um, there's a question. I don't know to whom this goes, but I, maybe that's for everyone. So is user experience and usability an issue among your customers? And that's asked by Wolfgang Eigner. Maybe I, I start with my customers. And the simple answer is yes, absolutely. So um, a couple of years ago, but, but, but it depends on what you're looking at. So a couple of years ago, um, we remodeled the user interface of our application to be streamlined, exactly focusing on one workflow and making that workflow as easy as pressing a single button. Uh, everyone said, yeah, kids play, whatever. And our sales skyrocket. So yes, this is needed. We need it. It has to be like this. On the other hand, if I have an edge case user which needs to use very specific tools, it's okay for them to use complicated dialogues which look like they could control a nuclear plant. So it, it really depends on, on, on your focus group. And so from the industry user, yes, usability is a big topic and it's very important. Yes, I, I definitely agree. So um, the, the, the biggest problem also, uh, Harald was facing when when he uh, was still leading the group was the 
to get people to use Visplor, which is a huge um, multi-window, multi-view um, visual analytics system, and people are just overwhelmed and they kind of feel that you can do a lot with it, but it's oh, where well, I have to click and then things move and ah, oh, that's that's scary. And so I think um, usability is really, really an issue. And I think what is also needed is more education on data visualization because with more education people will be more skilled to use more advanced visualizations and um, that I think would be a key issue as well and then we can also use more advanced techniques and more uh, complicated visualizations here. Do you think showcases like more uh, simplified showcases would help? that can reach a broader audience? Yeah, whenever you can reach a broader audience, I think that's important. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see, for example, in, in online newspapers, they're using now more and more advanced visualizations. If there is an election, for example, then the visualizations get more and more advanced and things like that are really, really needed, I think. Then people will be more skilled to use, to use visualization. I mean, in computer graphics industry, artists tend to create reels that represent their work. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with that, but would you think this, do you think that something like that for scientific visualization, well, for visualization in general, would be applicable? That we just create reels containing some data, some solution, and just let it out there on the social networks to try try to reach as broad audience as possible to even hint to the people this can be tackled and then let them reach out back. I would answer it with yes and no. Um, on, the, on the one hand, yes, it would be really great to show it to as many people as possible to, to tell them what is possible and how to read it and so on. And on the other hand, I noticed that when working with domain experts who are really, really deep into their domain, for them, it's really hard to abstract from some data set to their own data set. So I, therefore, it's a yes and no. I think on the one hand, showing what is possible is great. But on the other hand, they really have a hard time if, the, if you show them something to abstract how it would be for their own data. So we have a, I, oh, sorry. I, yeah. ju I, I just want to add on that because basically I, I want to answer your question with the title of my talk. Uh, a reel works because it catches the eye, because it is beautiful. It's showing you what you want to see. It's showing you what you want to have for your own data. And if you can manage that with your visualization, then yes, that will be, that will be a powerful tool. On the other hand, one thing is very important, especially for more complex visualizations, and that is to trust the visualization. If I see some fancy stuff and it, I think, oh, that might be great, but how do I get there? What really is the path from the data to that, to, so that I can trust the visualization, that I know, yes, I can the way I interpret it is correct and I understand it correctly and I can reproduce that, and I fear that needs a real understanding of the of the visualization and that understanding cannot be communicated with a real so i think a real can work as a teaser but not really more okay um wolfgang eigner has another very interesting question so how can concepts and prototype from scientific research make, make their way into products or being applied without the need of creating an own company around it? I think we had that question, yeah. right? Uh, I, believe, I believe we answered that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was in the beginning, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, no but problem. I did see, so uh, Helmut just asked the question. Um, would you think it would be a good idea to support the researching and publishing of supporting or enabling general applicability of a well-known state-of-the-art technique? And I believe this goes to everyone. Um, since I'm unmuted, I might I might start. Um, yes, I think I think now we are we're in the state that we have a lot of techniques and we know how to solve a lot of problems. And I think we need we need to 
really communicate to a, to a broad audience. So really uh, showing open source examples um, or providing open source examples, showing examples how to solve problems um, to really many domains and to a broad audience, I think would be very, very important. Yeah, I would add on that. Um, regarding the question of, of education, uh, it's like an important question. I think it is beneficial for us to um, to go into the domains. For for example, in academia, you can provide lectures for mechanical engineers or for medicine students or for like every domain, you could provide a lecture and um, go over first like the basics of visualization, the fundamentals. And then over the course of the lecture, you could um, go deeper and deeper and show what is possible, especially for their domain. Uh, and I think this would raise awareness that visualization is not only about making beautiful pictures, but also about um, communicating information and which helps to, to develop products or Uh, other research. Sorry, Petra, did you call out to me? I didn't hear it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I would like to hear your opinion on this too. Oh Honestly, my God, Sebastian doesn't have an opinion. And no, I was actually sort of drifting away at the moment. So um, could you please repeat the question? So, <laughs> so that happens. Uh, the question was, would you think it would be a good idea to support the researching and publishing of supporting or enabling general applicability of a well-known state-of-the-art technique? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I actually, um, I, I was drifting off by what Vanessa said that the importance of the um, of the teaching and the lecture aspects um, is is important, and I entirely agree uh, agreed on that. And that's where I drifted off. And I think with this this public uh, this possibility of of publishing optimizations and deliverables of existing technology, I think that's a very hard one. On the one hand, I believe every PhD student wants to have that because I mean, that's a, a tremendous amount of work to be done, really a lot of work. And traditionally the visualization community doesn't bother at all. So if you have two pictures, yes, fine, go ahead. If, And, and reusable, executable, maybe a, a CMake setup, which just works out of the box. That's, that's really, it's great, but nobody cares traditionally. And we've seen a change in the community. So, I mean, we, all, we even have now this, this capability for a couple of years now that um, the DFG is funding programmers to bring in the research prototypes from the prototype stage into something sustainable. Not necessarily product, but sustainable for further research. So I think that is important. Do I think that this needs to be published on our major conferences? No, I don't think so. Because the major conferences, I, I believe, are for the fundamental research, not the soft engineering part, which, which is necessary to do that. Yes, I understand that. And that needs to somehow go awarded, but it's not what we do, what, what academia is about. It's not, not at the core. What I could imagine is something like having the conferences and the, the, the journals we have, they work fine apart from the reviewing process without rebuttal, but other topic. Um, and maybe what would be a good idea is to open additional workshops and additional journals, purely focusing on that aspect of delivering the solutions. And I think if we could establish those and get those accepted within the community, and I believe that is possible, then this could be an option. But I think the traditional venues we have are not the right place for that. 
Who are the interest groups that would support that kind of publishing? And do you think that for academia, it would be interesting to have a place to publish that like that? I think so. I think so. Uh, both academia and industry will be interested in that. So, I mean, if we if we look at um, specific journals like um, CGNA, for example, they once in a while have pu uh, publications where they say, oh, we have now this great library, which contains that selection of visualization or rendering modules or whatsoever. That, that already happens. And I think a more focused communication for something like that, both industry and academia will accept it. I mean, for, for a PhD student, it's good to know where to go to ask for a question. And I'm thinking here, we should maybe think in a more modern model. So it's not really like we need just a journal where everyone can publish, yes, I've done that. But maybe what we need is a model combined with an online form. And, and I mean, honestly, if I'm now compiling something, it's not working, I go to Stack Overflow and say, what the fuck is not working here? Yeah. And then they will say, tell me that and this. If it's an academic problem and I, a, a research prototype, the Stack Overflow guys will say, uh, have you tried to get clean? So it's not really helpful. So if we have an academic uh, community around those prototypes, which knows about the problems, which knows, uh, I don't know, um, Yes, that version of OpenCV has a known bug or something like that. So I, I think with a focus, it can be helpful for the academic community, for the PhDs in the end. And with that, it will also speed up their work and it, it will then be also very valuable for the industry who tries to take it and apply it. Maybe, I don't know if it will working out, it's just an idea. Uh, we had another question, um, and it goes along the lines of what Johanna was saying. So the futuristic concepts of Industry 4.0 lead to substantial, uh, substantial challenges. How data visualization and data, data physicalization can support growing the maturity level of the industry? So Johanna, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, thanks. Just if you want, I had to readjust the camera because it's getting dark in Vienna and... and... I noticed that uh, my camera image was getting darker and darker. <laughs> now I think it's better. Um, yeah, so Industry 4.0 is a huge, huge challenge and with so many different uh, things to work on. And I think, uh, as I said in my talk, visualization and visual analytics is part of that and we are the enabler for several different other steps. So in case... Um, you want to do modeling, for example, you need visualization first to understand your data, to find out if the data quality is enough for modeling or not. Um, if you would like to understand um, some other processes in, in the manufacturing process, like, like flaws or changes over time or something like that, you need visualization to look into the data. So data visualization is really something that's somewhere in the middle and um, we will enable other solutions, but we will, or I think that visualization, visual, visual analytics is not going to be the solution for industry 4.0. It's important um, and we will enable for other things, but we will not solve everything. I'm sure about that. And we had another question um, from Wolfgang again. Uh, Sebastian recently mentioned uh, that problems in industry need to be solved in a very short amount of time. However, that doesn't fit very well to research methods and rigor, including validation and evaluation. Uh, what are your thoughts on about that? Um, great question, great question. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, for, for the industry, when a problem emerges, it's too late. We already need the solution. So what we really need to understand is what will be the next problems. We need to really look into the future beyond of the problems we haven't solved yet. And if we do that, this is one aspect. If we do that, then we have enough time. Then because this is a really, really a problem and, and we don't even know that this is a problem yet. And yes, if we can prepare solutions for that, brilliant, you have time. But the other thing, uh, and maybe the more practical thing, if we're, if we're uh, true about that is, yes, I need, a pro uh, I need a solution in two weeks, which does not mean that I cannot replace that solution in half a year. So even if we need to have an immediate solution, we can come up with a better one. 
And I mean, in, in, if, if I'm trying to sell a product, um, one aspect of course is to be first. So uh, to gain the market, but on the other hand, the other thing is also to be the best, to, to really keep the users. And so we are constantly looking at, at improving ourselves and our solutions. And I think even long-standing problems can have better solutions as we currently have. And this is, again, also a very good opportunity, which we just need to grab. I don't know, but something like that. We have another question. Uh, for the purpose of closing the gap between industry and scientific visualization, has publishing industrial visualization work case studies in industry journals and conferences been considered? Yeah, so we are, we are constantly doing that. We have very great uh, social media and, and media and press department at the Via Vis. And uh, we are constantly publishing our ideas and try to explain how we can support industry partners. So we constantly do that. And that also creates a lot of uh, replies and responses. So this is really great. But as I mentioned before, it's sometimes really hard for the people to abstract to their own ideas and um, to understand how they can use it in their own workflow. So it helps to some degree, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't replace the talking to people and explaining and um, yeah, mainly talking, looking at the problems and trying to understand their problems. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have touched really uh, different challenges today. And we didn't so much focus on the production, so production industry rather as a general industry. And well, the, the underlying tone was the manufacturing industry, but we touched a lot of it. And again, we highlight the problems coming between the research coming uh, between the research and the industry. I would like to ask each of you to give one final thought, th uh, thought, thought about today's discussion. So what would be the highlight that you would like the viewers to take away. And then I will say a few words and close the session. So one, two, three, who stopped? <laughs> right. Shall we do it in the same uh, round or in the same order that we did the talks? Just saying then that I have more time to think. <laughs> that, that's boring and I'm not sure I like it, but okay. So um, if, if we go for, for one highlight is I, I like this venue. I like that we talk together, that we sit together or stand together, talk about the gap, that we know it exists, that we try to, try to grasp it and try to see what we can do to, to answer that, to, to see the importance for the visualization and the differences in our views, and then try to come up with a solution together. And I think that is exactly the, the most important thing for me, this industry and academia. Yes, it's like that. But in the end, what we want to do is solve our problems together. And I think that is what we want to do and what we want to achieve. And in that light, I really like this venue. Yeah, I totally agree on that. Uh, for me, I would say um, it's important to, to network. I mean, they are therefore the, the venue is here, but not only in, inside our domain, but also with other domain experts, with uh, partners from the industry. Talk to them. Uh, you don't have to start a collaboration, but at least talk to them, educate them, so that maybe they are then educate uh, their colleagues and also try to educate uh, inside academia for uh, in academia, other applications, as I mentioned, like medicine or like uh, mechanical engineering. I think this will help a lot to raise awareness what visualization can do. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I, would, I would also, um, I, I totally agree. And I also would like to add this spreading of what visualization can do really to a broad audience, I think that's really important. We should produce open source solutions, really show what we can do, produce showcases, uh, 
use it in education, maybe also publish in other domains where the in, in the real really the domains of the experts. And we should communicate on all the possibilities on visualization and visual analytics. I think that's that's important and then we can raise the, the importance and the awareness for data visualization in, in the industrial workflows. Thank you, Hannah. Christina, do you want to say something? No, no. Oh, okay, I, th I thought I saw it. So once again, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in and having a lively discussion on this Discord and YouTube. There was a lot of very interesting comment and I ask uh, uh, Sebastian, Johanna and Vanessa to go back to Discord, read through the questions because there are still some questions that we haven't had time to uh, to, to raise, but they're nevertheless interesting questions, and I would ask you to, to reply to them there. And also, I would like to invite all of our viewers to submit to, to the special issue in computer graphics and application once more. So the things that we talked about today and the problems specifically relating to the manufacturing industry. What we want to learn is what are the requirements for visualization in different manufacturing industries? What are the problems? The visualization has many, many uh, solutions and many methods. And well, at the same time, the manufacturing industry has many, many different problems. And we would like to grasp, have a grasp of the field. What does it mean to provide visualization for manufacturing industry? So what, what are the most crucial problems and kind of establish this domain? What does this mean? We want you to show us the successful approaches, application examples, uh, visualization in different manufacturing industries. What were the challenges? How did you solve it? And we would also like to hear about lessons learned from collaborations between researchers and companies in industrial manufacturing. So we really want to raise awareness. This sounds so funny, raising awareness. Uh, and we want people to have an idea, what does it mean to conduct research and collaboration in industry, in particular visualization research for production industry? Because there is a lot of us working in this field, but when we talk about it, it seems like we are from different universes, although it's the same field. And we want to finally kind of draw the shape of this field. And for that, we really need help of all of you because you can bring us the useful insight. With that, I would like, I would kindly take all of our speakers, all of the participants once more, and I hope you have very successful projects and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for the nice discussions. I think this was really cool. <laughs> yeah, me too. Perfect, thank you. To additional help to visualization methods, such as the line integral convolution, convey information about the underlying flows come to. However, the influence of regions in the flow on each other is not visualized. In my talk, I will present a new dense flow visualization technique creating a multi-level hierarchy that provides insight into the region's connectivity using a probabilistic model. For more specific details, you can see my talk.
In cancer research, it's useful to group patients based on disease spread patterns to the lymph nodes. But once we create a new clustering methodology using spatial data, how do we explain spatial clustering to non-experts? In this multi-year project, we dealt with both a participatory design stage and a broader dissemination stage, and distill specific lessons for interpreting spatial clusters. There are many similarities between visual analytics and interactive optimization. The design of visual interfaces for optimization systems is an application of visual analytics. However, many optimization systems are automated. If you are thinking of building an interactive optimization system, come to our talk. We have prepared some tips for you. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. We present AgentViz, an application for the visual analysis of core center agent behavior using hierarchical glyphs. Our application relies on a data-driven scatterplot layout with each glyph representing an individual core center agent. We demonstrate the application with nearly 5 million cores who interact with over 6,500 core center agents. To reduce clutter, we present a dynamic aggregating glyph clustering technique that varies with zoom level, maximizing the screen space. What do you believe is the correlation between labor union participation and corporate profits of different companies? How would you update your belief after seeing this scatter plot? In this study, we use a new elicitation technique to understand how people update their beliefs about correlations after seeing different visualizations with and without uncertainty depictions. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Visualizing the performance progression of machine learning techniques is often achieved by plotting the accuracy in a line chart. For specific tasks such as multi-class classification, they hide important factors such as inner class confusion and instance level details. We propose Instance Flow, a tool for interactive visualization of the evolution of classifier confusion on the instance level. In this work, we conducted a design study with clinical researchers to develop a visual analytics application for exploring disease progression pathways. As a result, we developed DPVIS, which seamlessly integrates hidden markup models with interactive visualizations. The usage scenario and user experiences demonstrate the usefulness of the application to gain useful insights out of disease progression trajectories in a transparent manner. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Taximis is an interactive real analytic system to help tax officers identify suspicious tax evasion groups. The system integrates the traditional data mining algorithm and real analytics techniques. Four coordinate views are provided to support interactive exploration of tax evasion evidence. We demonstrate its usefulness through case studies using real-world test data and expert interviews.
Being able to perform visual analysis on sensitive data in a privacy-preserving way has become more and more important. In this work, we look at two major research questions in differentially private data visualization towards better understanding of the relationship between the privacy parameter, visualization type, the analytic tasks, and user's performance through cross-source user study and simulated comparisons. To interactively explore and visually analyze large multivariate data, for example, the cosmological simulation that is clustered into dark matter halos, we create a probabilistic data model in each cluster. We present a complete visual analysis system based on this data representation, which is especially well suited for the density-based visualizations shown here. We present an efficient approach for volume and isosurface ray tracing of structured AMR data on GPU-equipped workstations using a combination of two different data structures. Together, these data structures allow a ray tracing-based renderer to quickly determine which segments along the ray need to be integrated and at what frequency, while also providing quick access to all data values required for a smooth sample reconstruction kernel. How do user interactions lead to insights? We present a case study with a tool that supports five types of interactions for exploring drug target relations. Through an evaluation, we collected interaction trails, manually extracted interaction patterns, characterized the user insights, and explored the relations between interactions and insights. Hey everyone, I'm Jun Han Zhao, a PhD candidate at Purdue University Computer Graphics major and a research internship at Bausch Research North America. Here, we are presenting our recent research from the viewer using factorized prototypes to visually interpret and diagnose deep neural network. This work is co-authored by research scientists at Bausch, Zeng Dai, Dr. Pan Pan Xu, and Dr. Liu Ren. Blockchain has gained more attention and its applications are emerging. We collect 76 blockchain visualization tools and systematically classify them into five aspects. Target blockchain, blockchain data, target audience, task domain, and visualization type. In the end, we look at open challenge in blockchain visualization. Many techniques can be used to render and visually explore large 3D line sets with transparency. However, all these techniques differ in several aspects such as runtime performance, memory consumption, and image quality. In this work, we provide an extensive comparison study to discuss the advantages and drawbacks of transparency rendering techniques for large line datasets. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. We present a framework for the visual exploration of spine simulation data. We show the force distribution on spinal discs, enable assessments of imbalances, and reveal impact vectors that were not accessible before. This is a novel direction in medical visualization, and we hope that it might bridge the gap between biomechanical research and clinical application.
traditional clustering tools do not include users in the analysis loop. We present PK clustering, a new approach for interactive clustering using POVs. First, users specify their prior knowledge. Several algorithms are run and match with the prior knowledge. Users then build a consolidated clustering iteratively with suggestions based on consensus, the graph, and their knowledge of the data. The result is a consolidated clustering. We present an interface to visually analyze and steer zero-shot learning models. Our interface is designed to diagnose attribute mispredictions to convey potential failure modes in zero-shot learning. Using our interface, the user can select multiple categories for analysis. We allow the user to steer the model by changing the weights of potentially problematic attributes based on their analysis. We introduce a direct volume rendering approach that can render encrypted images directly from encrypted data sets. The rendering is performed by operations in the encrypted number space which are dual to operations in the plain text space. Therefore, the rendering system does not need to decrypt the data. This homomorphic volume rendering approach makes it possible to use untrusted servers for rendering without compromising privacy.